Yeah, my talk today is about some work I've been doing with uh, Michael here and uh, Valia Jose at the IPP, and it's about uh, electroweak skirmions. So yeah, so I will start with some uh, motivation, which is based on an analogy between um, low energy QCD and um, the scalar sector of the electric theory. And the analogy here, okay, and the analogy, uh, it's a pretty simple one. It's just the fact that you have a set of three Gaussian bosons that parameterize an SU2 matrix in both theories. They are obviously very different theories in all the aspects, but uh, we might ask how much further can we take this analogy? And in particular, I'm focusing here on the fact that we have other states in low energy QCD apart from mesons, and those are uh, baryons, and the ones that correspond to pions are nucleons. So, um, so yeah, so the, my concrete question is is there an analog to nucleons inside the electroweak theory, just as there are, there's an analog for pions? Uh, this might seem like a crazy question initially, but I will show that these states do exist under certain conditions. I will call them electroweak skirmions for reasons that will become clear in, in a moment. Uh, and yeah, th th they are a very exciting possibility because if they exist, it means that there are some states that have been hiding inside the electroweak uh, theory. They are, they, so they are new particles that do not come from adding a new field to a standard model, but instead, instead they arise from, um, um, from non-perturbative effects in, in the electroweak theory. These particles are also neutral and long-lived, so that means they could also be uh, good dark matter candidates, and uh, their existence and their uh, properties are very strongly tied to um, the troic symmetry breaking mechanism, and in particular to whether you have a linear or a non-linear realization of the symmetry. So this is the Smith versus F question. So I will talk about all these um, uh, points here. And I will also uh, discuss briefly the methodology that we used, which is based, based on some machine learning uh, techniques. Uh, and I think this is also interesting because you can apply these techniques to other non perturbative problems in, in QFT. But uh, for now, let me start with the square model, which is the case where skirmions arise um, originally. So uh, what they are are the topological solitons of this theory. Uh, which is basically color perturbation theory for pions. So just a very brief reminder of what that is. This is, um, we know that there's some chiral symmetry in QCD, which is spontaneously broken. So at low energies, you can construct an, an EFT um, for the constant bosons of, of this broken symmetry, which are the pions. You collect them into this unitary matrix U, and then you, can, you write the chiral Lagrangian as a function of, of U. And an interesting fact about this theory is that um, its static uh, solutions have some non-trivial properties, some non-trivial topological properties, sorry. So um, let me go into more detail about the topology here. Um, so I'm talking about static uh, solutions. Uh, so they obviously only depend on uh, the spatial coordinates. So the domain for our functions is three-dimensional space. Um, and then for, in order for these solutions to have finite energy, you need the fields to go to a constant as you go to infinity in any direction. And that means that you can apply a well-known topological procedure, which is um, compact, uh, compactification. And in this case, it consists of adding a single point, the point at infinity to your domain, and then it becomes, it turns from a three-dimensional space into a three-dimensional sphere. Uh, so what I'm saying here is that the domain of U, uh, the U matrix can be viewed as a three-dimensional sphere. And then its target space is SU2, which is also known to be a three-dimensional sphere. So it's just a mapping from the sphere to the sphere. And we know that those are classified by a winding number. This is, you can define it as an integral for over um, uh, this field. And uh, it's such that it's always an integer and it never changes as long as you do smooth deformations of, of the field configuration. So this divides um, the set of static field configurations of this theory into different sectors. Um, and um, you can never go to, from one sector to another 
by doing a smooth transformation because they have different winding number. The, the, the vacuum has winding number equals zero, and then you have uh, configurations with winding number equals one, and those are what we call skirmions. So as an example, I have a lot of uh, here on the right. Um, this is a two-dimensional version of the of, of the setting, but otherwise it's completely equivalent. And we have this field here, which um, has as domain the two-dimensional space, and as, uh, and it takes values on a two-dimensional sphere. So all these arrows are uh, unit vectors. Uh, as you go away from the origin to infinity, uh, all these arrows mu must point into the same direction. In this case, it's downwards. So you can identify all those points at infinity or at the border and make them the south pole of these fields. So that's how compactification works in this case. And then you get these configurations here, which are just examples. These two are uh, have uh, winding number one, so they are both skirmions, and you can deform one into the other. And then there's this one, which has winding number minus one. That's an anti-skirmion. So you can never turn this into this by smooth deformation. So that's the topology of the theory, and I should also uh, talk about uh, the energy. So whenever you have topological solitons in, in a theory, um, they are local minima of the energy. So the global minimum is the vacuum, and then you can have other stable configurations which are local minima that are a bit higher up in the energy. A useful uh, tool for, for thinking about uh, this is Derek's theorem, and in particular, the argument used in the proof of, in the proof of uh, Derek's theorem, which is you take a field configuration, you perform a rescaling, and you see what, it, what effects it has on the energy. So uh, let's use that in, in our case. So we are here uh, dealing with color perturbation theory. The power counting is based on the number of derivatives that each operator has, and the leading order has two derivatives. So we would have, if we only had the leading order energy, we would have uh, an energy proportional to, to an operator with two derivatives. We can now perform a rescaling of, uh, of uh, the field configuration that goes into the energy, and we see that the energy changes as the scaling parameter lambda. That means that you can make this energy as small as you want by making lambda smaller. Uh, so basically, you can shrink your field configurations and get uh, lower energy. And that means that even if you have configurations with winding number one, they will not be, be stable because they will always be shrinking and decreasing their energy. So the next thing to, to try is to go to the next to leading order in the in kind of perturbation theory, so include a four derivative operator. And then you get an energy that scales like lambda plus something over lambda, and that does have a, a minimum. So the energy now it's uh, bounded from below. And that means in principle, you would have local minima uh, in this theory. And that's what uh, Skorn did in the early 60s. He wrote down this Lagrangian, which is um, the leading order term in the in kind of perturbation theory and a specific uh, four derivative operator. And he found that there are topological solitons in this theory. Uh, so that's uh, a very nice topological fact about uh, this particular version of chiral perturbation theory. But an important physics insight is that the properties of skirmions uh, match those of uh, variance. And this was, so there was a lot of effort on this by Witten and collaborators in the 70s and in the 80s. And they were able to show that you can predict many of the properties of nucleons and delta variance with just one free parameter in the theory, which is the coefficient of the, of the skirm operator. So that's really a remarkable fact. You, you start with a theory of pions. You just have the pion field, and you get the variance for free as some non-trivial configurations of, of those fields. Since then, um, skirmings have been discovered in other places, especially in condensed matter physics uh, systems. Uh, and there's an entire class of materials here that um, uh, in which skirmings have been observed. This is a two-dimensional version of the three-dimensional problem that we had before. Uh, these are uh, materials in which you have some magnetization field, and it is the configurations of this magnetization field that give you skirmings. And you can see here that these are real Im images from experiments. Uh, you can see that these skirmings are produced in, in large quantities, and uh, you can so you can manipulate them, uh, move them around. It has lots of uh, technological applications. Uh, so, for example, people are thinking. Uh, about um, 
developing devices for storing mem uh, memory using uh, these kinds of uh, things, these topological defects. So, okay, so we have seen that experiments have been observed in, in QCD and in condensed matter. And now let's go into the main topic of the talk, which is the experiments that appear in the electroweight theory. So as I said in the beginning, there's a similarity here with uh, the square model, which is the fact that we have um, three would-be ghost on bosons uh, in the electroweight theory. These are the longitudinal components of the gauge fields. They, uh, they can be collected into this SU2 matrix, which takes values on a three-dimensional sphere. Its domain can be also viewed as a three-dimensional sphere. So it's a similar uh, situation topology. But then there are extra degrees of freedom in the theory. And in particular, um, the most relevant ones are the gauge fields and the, and the Higgs. Um, and that means that um, they might destroy the topological properties that we had before. Because since the goldstones are related to the gauge fields, the winding that you have in the goldstone sector can unwind through the gauge fields. So it's not clear at all that we can have skirmions in the intertropic theory yet. Uh, yet. So yeah, so this is just a collection of uh, fields that I will consider for, from now on. They, they are the most relevant uh, ones for electroic skirmion physics. So the goldstones, the Higgs, and the um, rest of the components of the gauge fields. And I'm only listing here the, um, the gauge fields for the SU2 part of the electroweak symmetry, because it's known that the U1 factor is not that relevant for, for electroic skirmion uh, properties. So I, I will just neglect it from, from, from now on. You may notice that I'm using here the language of the heft. Uh, so in fact, my next slide is about this. Um, so yeah, so basically for the retroweak theory, we have two options uh, when uh, um, constructing a, an effective field theory for, for it. We need an effective field theory because we will need some effective operator in order for the schemas to be stable, just as in the case of the strong term. And so we have these two options. We can have a nonlinear realization of the symmetry, that's the head, as we all know, and then we can have a linear realization of the symmetry, which is the SMEF. You can view the SMEF as a particular case of the heft in which all the dependence on the Higgs and on the goldstones happens through this uh, uh, combination, the Higgs tablet. And, but most importantly for us here, uh, the topology of the two, of the scalar uh, sector of the two theories, it's, uh, is different. So in the heft case, you have a well-defined matrix of goldstone bosons for every value of the Higgs. So you have this three-dimensional sphere everywhere. Um, and yeah, a simple example of the kind of um, manifold that you can have here is just one that factorizes into two parts, the set of values for the Higgs, the real line, and the set of value for the goldstones. And they are completely independent. For the SMEF, uh, uh, we have a different case because um, when H equals minus B, so when the Higgs tablet vanishes, this three-dimensional sphere, um, so all the points in this three-dimensional sphere are equivalent because they all give the same value to the Higgs tablet. And that means that you can identify them and it collapses to a single point. And that has important consequences in, in, in topological solutions because you can have, so you can wind around the sphere, okay? But then you can smoothly uh, change the value of the Higgs into this point at which the sphere is a point. And then you can go back to the, to the value that you had with a different winding around the sphere. So in that sense, the SMEF um, has a lower chance of being able to support these solutions. Um, and in fact, so we have done numerical calculations for both. We did find some Skirmion-like uh, configurations in the SMEF, but it's unlikely that they are uh, stable because of this, of this fact. So from now on, I will focus in the, on the heft in which it's pretty clear that experiments are there. Um, and of course, we are not the first ones to, to think about electroic experiments. People have uh, uh, studied them before, but always in some, uh, in some approximation, in some limit in which uh, some of the fields do not appear. So first of all, I have here the, um, the frozen Higgs limit. This is the case in which the Higgs mass is infinite. So the Higgs is frozen at uh, its uh, depth. And you only have then the gauge fields and the goldstones. This is then a technical theory. It was studied in the 80s 
And people found that um, you can have skirmions here, but they are only metastable. So the original skirmions were protected from decaying by an infinite energy barrier that separates them from the vacuum. And in this case, you have a finite energy barrier. Um, another limit that you can take is the one in which you decouple the gauge fields, and then you only have the Higgs and the Gostons. Uh, and in this case, the skirmions are still there and they are stable, and as long as you're in the non-linearization of the symmetry. And finally, you can take both limits and then you're back at the original storm model. So, uh, yeah. so those are the different things that have been considered so far. And our aim was to not make any of these approximations and instead consider the full theory with all the, with all the relevant fields and see if experiments are still there and what their properties are. So the topology here is more complicated than in the other case, that's because we have more fields. We have a scalar winding number, just as before. This is the integral that defines it. It always outputs an integer number, uh, as I said. And then there's, uh, for the gauge sector, there's the chain Simons number as the topological charge. And uh, this is also defined in terms of an integral, um, similar integral, but it, it can output an, a real number. It, it doesn't have to be an integer. The chain Simons number is an integer when you are in a pure gauge configuration, but yeah, otherwise it's a real number. So that's something to keep in mind. And um, an important thing about those two numbers is that they are not gauge invariant. So if we were to define the Sturman configuration as um, one having winding number equals one or having chain Simons number equal one, uh, that wouldn't be a gauge invariant definition. And since skirmions are physical objects, uh, we need some gauge invariant uh, definition for them. So, uh, yeah, so since uh, both numbers change by the same amount when you do a, a, a gauge transformation, you can define a gauge invariant number, which is the difference between the two. Uh, and this, what, what it measures is the relative winding between the gauge sector and the scalar sector. So, uh, yeah, so that's what we call the uh, fine skirmions with this number close to, to one. So let me stress here that this number is not an integer. In, the, in general, it's um, a real number. And the situation that we expect to have would look like something like this. So there's um, uh, at skirmion number equals zero, we are at the vacuum. And that should be the global minimum of the energy. And then as you go away from this configuration, the energy sh should increase, right? Then at some point, and so you can have different possibilities. It can just keep increasing. Uh, and then there are no topological solitons, no local minima. You can have a local minimum. Uh, and that's when we would say we have found uh, an electrode experiment. And uh, you can have something that I'm trying to represent with this uh, red line, which is similar to uh, what I mentioned for that uh, theorem before. So it could be that there's no lower bound on the, on the energy of the configurations that are uh, around this point, and they can always uh, shrink. So the way to prevent that is to have uh, some effective operator that raises this energy, just as in this current uh, case. So let's look at the effective operators that we have in the heft. Well, in the sector of the head that, that uh, we're looking at. Just a brief uh, reminder here. So you organize the head Lagrangian as a sum of operators, each of which splits into two parts. The first one is a general function of the Higgs field to resum their terms with arbitrary number of uh, Higgses. And then you have this part, which I'm calling here Q, uh, which contains the dependence on the rest of the fields and the derivatives of the Higgs. Uh, and that's what gives us the power counting. So simplifying a little bit, you have a power counting in the heft, which is uh, the chiral dimension. It's, it's similar to the counting in terms of the number of derivatives in the um, in kind of perturbation theory. And you have, so these are all the operators with chiral dimension two, they are the standard model. And then you have those operators with chiral dimension four, which is the next to leading order. Uh, and we would need at least one of these, according to that theorem, to get skirmings. Um, okay, so um, yeah, so now a uh, complete effective field theory study would be considering each of these operators and seeing if they can generate skirmings or not. 
but as a first approach, I will do that later, but as a first approach, I will just consider a combination of these operators that has a high chance of giving us fermions, and that's the difference between two of them, QD1 and QD2, which gives the original skirm term. So if skirmions are there, it's likely that they will appear if you include this combination. I'm parameterizing the Wilson coefficient in the traditional way here. So there's this E parameter, which if you look at um, um, the half power counting, it's proportional to the cutoff scale. Um, okay, so that's all we need to need about the framework. And now I can tell you about how to compute the skirmion, how we compute the skirmion solution and, how, and what it looks like. So first of all, we impose an ansatz. Um, you can always choose the unitary gauge. So the dependence on the, on the Goldstone bosons is uh, gone and it's, it appears all in the, in the gauge uh, fields. Then for the Higgs, we impose a spherical symmetry. So uh, the Higgs field is completely determined by this profile function, which is just a single function of a single real variable. And for the gauge fields, we impose the standard ansatz, which is known as the spherical ansatz. And this depends on three different profile functions. Um, so that's our ansatz. And here's where the machine learning uh, comes. So we parameterize this, uh, these four profile functions using a neural network. Um, so yeah, so very quickly, because uh, many in the others probably know about this, but a neural network is uh, just some kind of nonlinear function uh, with lots of internal parameters. Um, what it does is, in our case, it takes a single input and then it proceeds by layers. In going from one layer to the next, what you do is a linear transformation and then some nonlinear function applied to each of the outputs of the linear transformation. That's what, what's called um, an activation function. And we use a sigmoid for that. So this is the form that it takes so this is going from the, from the first layer to the second, and then you apply that procedure again several times. In our case, it's the, the structure of the network that we use is exactly what I have here. It's two hidden layers with five nodes each. And yeah, and then um, the way in which these things are useful is you tune the internal parameters that they have. Those are the, the matrices that appear in linear transformations so that the network solve, uh, solves your problem. Um, that's in the language of machine learning, it's training the network. Uh, and you, use, you usually define a loss function such that when you minimize it, you get the optimal network. Then you can uh, plug that loss function into some machine learning uh, framework, and it will proceed by gradient descent, and it will give you the, the, the network that, that's optimal for your problem. So what we need to do is to figure out what the loss function uh, is uh, for our problem. Uh, and uh, so what's our problem? Our problem it would be finding a local minimum of the energy. That's the screaming configuration. But I, um, maybe we can be a bit more ambitious and uh, we can try to produce a plot like this. So um, looking at how the energy changes with the screaming number. So we would like to be able to fix the screaming number and some boundary conditions and minimize the energy. Uh, and you can do that by means of this loss function, which is equal to the energy, so that the energy will be minimized. And then it has some terms to ensure that these conditions are satisfied. Um, so intuitively, intuitively with what happens here is that first, so you have a very large um, coefficient here. So these two terms are uh, the dominant ones. The minimization procedure then makes the things inside here very small, close to zero, and then the conditions are satisfied. Then this becomes dominant, the energy, and then the energy is minimized while you satisfy the, the two conditions. So this is a general procedure for minimizing um, functionals uh, uh, constraint with, with some constraints, right? And these constraints, in fact, so this is, a constraint that imposes that the, the integral of the fields is equal to some number. So if you were to solve this problem using other numerical procedures, it could be quite complicated. Uh, and with this machine learning technique, it's quite easy to, to express it. So we have developed some uh, code for doing this, some general code. You can just give it the, the function that you want to minimize and the, and the conditions it, uh, that have to be satisfied. 
and it um, gives you the, the answer using neural networks. Uh, so that's all about the method. And then here are some of the, some of the solutions that, that we get with this method. So for example, here I'm fixing winding number equals 0 0.4. And this is the configuration that, that has the minimal energy for, for that uh, condition. Uh, so these are the four profile functions. The first three ones are the, um, the ones that determine the gauge fields. And then the last one, eta here, is the one that um, gives the Higgs. And this is another configuration, for example, with winding number uh, equals 0 0.8. So you can do this for any value of the winding number, and that's uh, in that way you can produce this plot. So this is the actual real version of the cartoon plot that I have been showing so far. Um, so this is very nice. You can see how the energy functional changes as you move in field space in the direction in which the Skirmian number increases. Um, the first thing to notice here is that some of these curves do have a local minimum at a skirmion number close to, to one. So we can say that we have found, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> so um, yeah, so we can say that we have found an electronic skirmion here. The different lines come from the fact that um, I'm using different values of the Wilson coefficient for the skirm operator. Um, so you can see that there are some cases in which this local minimum doesn't exist. And this happens because the Wilson coefficient is too large. So the energy of skirmions is raised, um, it is so high that there's, there's no barrier separating them from the vacuum. And then as you make this coefficient smaller, you start getting the, the, the local minimum here. There's a critical value of the Wilson coefficient, uh, the point at which the barrier and the local minimum are approximately at the same height. And that corresponds to this E parameter being 0 0.9. And then uh, let me explain where I have two plots here. So this one is um, in physical units in TEV, and this one is in some natural units for skirmion physics. Um, it's basically this E parameter times the energy, and you you can learn th uh, things from both. So from this one, you can see that the local minimum is approximately at the same height uh, for any value of the Wilson coefficient. That means that the skirmion mass is inversely proportional to to this E parameter. So the skirmion mass is 10 TeV over E. And so the skirmion mass is the energy of this, of this uh, local minimum. And then from the other plot, um, we can see that the height of the barrier, uh, when it appears, is about maybe 10 T, uh, 11 TeV, and then it goes down to 10 TeV, but it doesn't change by that much. So the skirmion uh, barrier is approximately constant at around 10 or 11 TeV. I think that's all for these two for these two plots. So we have found here electroweak skirmions in some regime for the for the Wilson coefficient of the skirm term. Uh, we can compute many other things. So that those were the energy and uh, the mass. We can also compute the the radius of the skirmion configuration since we have the all the profile functions that determine the full configuration. The skirmion radius is proportional to one over e. So this is also proportional to the skirmion mass. Uh, okay, so that was for the skirm operator, and as I promised, I go back now to the to all the other effective operators, and um, the idea is to try to see if any other operators support skirmions. Um, so uh, yeah, what we did is we went through through the list of all the operators that we had. The first four ones are the standard models, so uh, we know by direct theory that they uh, cannot generate skirmions. Then we have three operators which vanish in a pure gauge. And if you notice that the skirmion number is close to an integer for the skirmion configuration, that means it's, it's close to a pure gauge. So uh, these operators will not be able to raise the energy of skirmions because they will be close to zero. And finally, there are four, uh, five operators with uh, four derivatives each. Uh, <laughs> And uh, yeah, and what we need is just go numerically through each of them, including them, and seeing if they generate skirmion configurations. And we only found that these two uh, generate skirmions. So that's our, those are QD1 and Q2, the two that appear in the original skirm term, in fact. But they, do, they don't have to appear in the combination, in the specific combination of the skirm term. Uh, so what we need is we, um, 
studied for which values of the two coefficients, CD1 and CD2, you can get skirmings. And uh, it's this region here in, in color. So, what, uh, so we have identified the region in parameter space of the heft in which skirmings can exist. So if we are inside skirmings exist, if we find that these coefficients are outside, we know they are not there. And the color gradient indicates the, the mass of the skirmions. So as you go away from the line on the right, the skirmion mass increases. And as you arrive to, to the left part, uh, the skirmion mass is close to the height of the barrier, and then the skirmion disappears. So that's why we have this band here. Um, OK, and a final comment about the other operators, the one that didn't generate um, skirmions by themselves. So it could be that if you include them together with the ones that generate skirmions, they produce some effect in skirmion physics. So we did a very uh, quick calculation just to see if this would be the case. Uh, and we computed their, their contribution to the energy density in a pre-computed configuration with just QD1 and QD2. And we found that their contribution to the energy is pretty small, order 1%. So we took that as an indication that um, these operators are probably not that important for skirmion physics. It would be nice to have a more detailed study of, of these operators, but this will probably be a correction to the, to the leading order picture that, that we're getting here. So that's all about the, 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 cal the calculation of the skirmion configurations and, and the, the properties that we can derive from that. And then very quickly, I will go through the phenomenology just in, in four slides. So um, first about skirmion production and decay. Um, we can notice that um, the, the, the transition that would create a skirmion or by which it would decay is very similar to an, in, an instant on process. So the two things are a transition from two minima of the energy uh, which are separated by a barrier, which is about uh, 10 TeV. So if I think if I remember correctly, the sphaleron, which is the top of this barrier, the standard model sphaleron, is about 9 or 10 TeV. So it's, uh, it's actually very similar in energy too. Um, and we know that instant on transitions are very highly suppressed. So that means that probab probably uh, streaming production is not very likely at current colliders at the LHC. Uh, one way to, to understand this is just that this is a tunneling process at low energies, and there's a huge exponential suppression. So we don't expect to see these things at the LHC in the near future. It could be the case that um, you would be able to produce them at future colliders in which energy is comparable uh, to the height of the barrier and reach. But uh, we, yeah, we haven't computed that yet, so we don't know. Uh, but since this is very suppressed, it also means that uh, the decay rate is very low. So these things are very long lived. And then that might be pointing uh, that uh, they are viable dark matter candidates, maybe. Um, OK, so since we cannot hope to observe skirmish directly at colliders, what we can do, since we have identified precisely which operators generate them and, and which don't, uh, is just look at other limits to these operators from other sources. And then we can construct uh, skirmion physics from that. Um, so we have, yeah, so we have some limits from, uh, some experimental limits from LHC on these operators. These are the ones that Antonio has been talking about uh, before. Um, those were over dimension eight operators in the SMEFT, but those are completely equivalent at that level to um, the um, four derivative operators that I'm considering in the heft. So you can translate the limits in, in the dimension in the SMEFT into the ones in the heft. Uh, and they're typically, well, limits and linear, and linear combinations of these two coefficients. Then there's some theoretical limits, uh, mainly from positivity, which also sets limits on, on linear combinations of the coefficients. And finally, if you want terms to behave as classical particles, which is the only regime in which we really understand how, how they behave, then they, they should be as, at least larger than their Compton wavelength. Since their radius is proportional to their mass and their Compton wavelength is proportional to one over their mass, their mass, that means that this sets a lower limit on the mass. So we have upper limits on the mass from this and a lower limit from, from this. So the mass is constrained from, from all these indirect limits. This is a summary of all those limits. 
Um, this is the same picture as before, but now zoomed in. So uh, this is the, page, the space of the two uh, Wilson coefficients that generate skirmions. And the, the region with the color gradient is the one in which skirmions exist. Um, the blue region is excluded by positivity. You can see that it excludes a huge region in this case. Then there are the experimental limits, which are the dashed lines. So we must be inside this region here. And that means that uh, um, the allowed region for, for skirmions is this triangle here. And then there's the um, orange line, which is just a rock bound for skirmions to behave as classical particles. So if skirmions are, if skirmions exist and they behave as classical particles, they must be in this, in this small region here. And that means that we can determine their mass very well. They should have a mass of about one TV or the, at the very most two TV. So they, 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 yeah, this gives us a very uh, nice constraint on, on the mass of skirmish. And the final point about uh, phenomenology is that um, it's about uh, skirmish and dark matter. So for this, we don't know much. We only did a very nice calculation uh, in our last paper just to see what kind of numbers one would need for, for this to work. Um, so we assume that the skirmion um, abundance is set in a freeze out mechanism. Um, we approximated their, their annihilation cross section as just their size, their geometric cross section. Um, and we impose that their abundance is what we have measured for dark matter. And we got this number for the mass, so about 60 GeVs. Um, that means, so that's well below the limit from uh, the classical behavior of skirmions. So the, the, the Compton wavelength would be larger than their size in this case. But this, so in that sense, it seems like it wouldn't work. But this whole calculation is at the very best good only to the order of magnitude approximation one order of magnitude above this is already close to the TeV limit that we have. So it's really unclear where all of this would work. And of course, there's lots of work to do this, uh, to do here. So for example, one should compute the finite uh, temperature corrections to the skirmion potential uh, in order to see how they behave in the early universe and um, probably more accurate calculations of how they annihilate, etc. So yeah, so they remain an interesting possibility, but it's, yeah, there's a lot of work to, to, to be done here. Um, and to conclude, let me so summarize what I have uh, said. Uh, first about the, the, the methodology. So we have developed these machine learning techniques, which you can use to solve uh, non-participative problems in, in QFT. Um, and then uh, we have applied it to, to skirmions and we have found uh, several things about their physics. First, the, they exist in the, in the, at, in the um, electroweak theory, at, at least in the nonlinear realization. We have identified for which values of the Wilson coefficients they exist. And um, our the phenomenology, we know that they will not be produced in the near future at colliders. But since we have the Wilson coefficients that produce them, we can look at indirect limits. And in this way, we get that our mass should be around one TeV. And yeah, and finally, well, the possibility that experiments are dark matter, I think it's very interesting, but it's still an extra. And that's all, thank you.